All right, everybody. Thank you for being here. We got a treat today, a former college football player, a Rose Bowl MVP, uh, one time the youngest head coach in college football, now an analyst and TV personality, and uh, I'm just thrilled to have him here. So Coach Rick Neuheisel, thanks for being here today. Mark, it's a thrill to be with you. Uh, as you say, I was once the youngest head coach in college football, and I'm looking at the two of us juxtaposed on this Zoom call. I'm saying I don't look so young anymore. <laughs> uh, coach, you look great. But, but it's like uh, head coaching years are like dog years. You just multiply by seven. That's how old I am. Yeah, they have to be, right? It's one of those things where you take the before and after picture, and it's two different people coming out. Without question. Without question. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of those younger years, you were a star player at McClintock High School, Tempe area, I think male athlete of the year. But you choose to walk on at UCLA, who was at that time a, a nationally powerful football program. What I want to know is what's what's motivating you to walk on at a program like that rather than go somewhere else, maybe play right away or whatever it might be. So I was recruited by a number of Ivy League schools. I was recruited by the academies. I actually took a trip to both Princeton. Uh, and Navy uh, and considered those places and some what we now call FCS programs. Northern Arizona was interested. Weber State was interested. But uh, it, like all kids, I had a dream of playing in the quote unquote big time. Right. And a friend of my dad's said, hey, why don't you and I jump over to Los Angeles and watch UCLA play? We'd been watching uh, you know, all the statistics on Sunday morning to see whose quarterbacks were faring well, whose weren't faring so well. And there was a day uh, in 1978 that UCLA went up and played Oregon State and went 0 for 10 in passing. <laughs> 0 for 10. My dad said, you can play there <laughs> at UCLA. So his buddy said, I'll take him over for the game next week. And so we went over and watched Stanford play UCLA in the Coliseum, Peter Bormeister kicked, made a kick to, to win the game at game's conclusion. And that was fun and exciting. But what was really fun and exciting is to go back from the Coliseum, which is about 12 miles from campus there in Westwood and to look at UCLA and to see it, it was at night and everybody was kind of having fun. All the fraternities were jumping and I'm, I'm looking around going, yeah. I could see this. Then we cruise Sunset Boulevard, which is right there. And the campus sits on Sunset. And we went right. down and you're literally a stone's throw from Hollywood. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is college. So that stuck with me. And then, uh, lo and behold, that year, UCLA would actually play in the Fiesta Bowl, which is where I grew up in Tempe. Perfect. And they played Arkansas. And that same friend, without me knowing, took a film to UCLA of me playing. And I later got a call from Jed Hughes, who was the defensive coordinator on the staff. And he said, we'd love for you to come and take a look at UCLA in the spring. We want you to be an invited walk on. And so I went and looked, fell in love again. And then I didn't hear from anybody for three months, three <laughs> months went by. I was like gone out of the picture. And so I said, you know what? It's okay. I'm going to go to Princeton. I liked uh, Princeton. I'm going to go. And Terry Donahue called me like on an early day in August, maybe a week before the training camp was going to start and said, Hey, are you coming? We ha haven't gotten uh, your questionnaire back or whatever the things I was supposed to fill out for, to get into the dorms for camp. And I said, coach, I haven't heard from you guys in three months. Oh, wow. I'm going, I'm going to go to Prun go to Princeton. And he said, well, that's probably a good decision if you don't think you can play at this level. <laughs> and it was like, He'd thrown a line in the water and I was the bass. I just yep. hit the line. I said, I didn't say I couldn't play. He says, well, you kind of are saying it. If you're going to Princeton, I said, what time do I need to be there? And the next, the rest, as they say, is history. I drove to, I drove to California from Arizona in uh, a old Camaro that my mom and dad had given me had the eight track pulled in Bob Seger's holiday Hollywood nights. When I got to <laughs> sunset Boulevard and I was ready. Boom, baby. I love that. That's a great story. Uh, yeah. For those who don't know Westwood, you think LA, you just think one giant megalopolis town. If you go to UCLA and you go to Westwood, Sunset Boulevard to the north, as you said, Wilshire to the south, West LA, just a couple miles from the ocean. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful spot. And I would say that if you're an athlete and you're getting recruited by UCLA and you take that campus visit, 
unless there's something major going on somewhere else, I don't know how you say no to it, but that's a, that's a fascinating story. You mentioned the guy in my next question, Terry Donahue. He, he uh, is a fascinating guy to me. Was he in the quarterback's room a lot? Was he interacting with the offense a lot? What was your experience as a player with Terry Donahue? Terry was not in the quarterback's room. Uh, Terry was an old uh, nose guard by trade, but really was into offensive line play. He would always go and sit down as to how are we going to run the ball? His, his question every week to the offensive staff is how are we going to run the ball? And the second question is how are we going to get the ball out to the green, green grass? Uh, he was a Pepper Rogers guy. So Pepper Rogers was his, was his mentor and he worked for Pepper at Kansas and then, uh, followed Pepper to UCLA. And as it all turned out, he ends up getting the head job. Uh, when Pepper, when Dick Vermeil left for uh, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles, he was very, very instrumental in me ever becoming a coach because not only did he give me an opportunity to come to UCLA and, and eventually earn a starting job at UCLA, but then he called me right after I was done and said, look, I think you'll have a meteoric rise. That was his term, meteoric rise in coaching if you'll come and do this. And in 1987, when Troy Aikman transferred from Oklahoma to UCLA, I was the guy he wanted to teach Troy the UCLA offense. And so that's how I got into the coaching racket. So I owe a lot to Terry. I miss him. Yeah, he, he is very much missed. I have the video they played of him at the Rose Bowl at the LSU game last year. And it, uh, it gives me goosebumps every time I watch it. It's this beautiful little tribute with his family at the end. He was uh, a special guy. The, the last really the last time UCLA was really rolling as a football program. I love to get the stories about him because from afar, obviously I didn't, I didn't play for him. He retired before my time even, but he's a guy that I admire in the history of this sport. So I, I'm going to have another question for you about him um, later. For those who, who may not know, uh, things went pretty well for Rick at UCLA. His senior season, he ends up beating out Steve Bono for the starting job. Steve Bono only went on to play about 15 years in the NFL. So That's right. big, big win for Rick there. But the season does not get off to a great start. The Bruins start 0-2-1, and, and Rick oh, is... 3 and one Oh, three and one. Pardon oh, me. Three and one. Yes. So you were benched at some point there. I've heard you tell this story. What did Terry Donahue say to you when he said, we got to try something else here? <laughs> he walks me out onto the practice field. Now, no one else is on the practice field. It's just he and I. And we sit in the stands there. There's this little couple bleachers there to watch practice. Spalding Field is the name of the place. And he says, Rick, one of two things happens when the team isn't going well. And as I said, we're Oh, three and one. Uh, he says either the head coach goes or the quarterback goes. <laughs> and just so you understand, I'm not going <laughs> a perfect line. It, it, it's like saying all of you who are playing tomorrow, take a step forward. Not so fast, Rick, not so fast, Rick. Right. Right. Uh, and it, it was a gut punch. Yeah, because it was my fifth year. I was, I had climbed the ladder literally and figuratively. I had was fifth string, fourth string, third string, second string, first string. Right. And now I'm being told you're going back to second string. And tr in truth, I was actually going back to third string because as a fifth year senior, you're not going to waste a lot of repetitions on a guy that's not going to be in the program next year. Right. So I was going to be maybe the backup that would come in an emergency. But if it was a game that was in hand, then you were going to get more experience to somebody who was going to be around. So I was basically looking at the abyss uh, in the mirror uh, in terms of the end. And now you have to ask yourself questions like, is this what was this worth it? Because uh, there's no time to transfer and go anywhere else. Your, your eligibility is up. Right. And I would love to tell you that I handled it with a great maturity and, <laughs> and that I was, you know, just all about the team, but I was mad yeah. because I felt like the offense was doing some good things. We, I threw three touchdown passes against Arizona state uh, and threw for over 300 yards in that game. I mean, what are we doing here? And 
you know, but it was, it was just ego. It was just your personality because you fought so hard to get this chance. And now to make the call and tell family and friends, Hey, I'm not playing. Uh, that's yeah. just part of the deal. But, but as fate would have it, the fifth game, we play Stanford and Steve Bono gets hurt in the first quarter of the game. And I got to go in again. I hadn't had a rep of practice. I'm standing over there on the sideline going, I got to get myself going here. And I got a second chance. It's like the governor, you know, sending the reprieve. Yeah. yeah. Well, and midnight's not coming yet, Rick. We're, we're going to give you another chance. Well, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful story. And it all ended extremely well in uh, college football legend and lore. UCLA against all odds would battle back that season. They would finish. Remember, we said they started 0-3 and 1. They finished 6-4 and 1, 6-1 and 1 in the conference. They beat Washington. They beat USC. And guess who gets the Rose Bowl bid? UCLA. Washington loses to Washington State the last weekend. The Bruins are back in the Rose Bowl. So um what's it like January 2nd? I believe January 1st was a Sunday that year. January That's right. 2nd you trot out onto the Rose bowl grass. It's the Rose bowl game. What's that like as a player heading out into the field for that game? Well, a couple things. Uh, first of all, we're down 10 to six at halftime against the Trojans. And we know we need Washington state to win for us to have a chance. And the word comes in Washington state's beating them. And we're all looking at each other. Okay, man, we're going out there and play. We went right down the field on the opening drive. I threw a touchdown pass to Carl Durrell, now the head coach at Colorado. Yes. And uh, Jack Del Rio hit me in the stomach right as I was throwing it. And he and he's, has some choice words for me in the bottom of the pile, right? Sure. Take that. You can imagine the, the, uh, the noun used there. All and right. I said, and all I said is I repeated the same noun, but I said touchdown before it. Boom. <laughs> yeah. So – we get to go to the Rose Bowl. We'd all been the year before. We'd played Michigan in 1982 and were treated like kings. So we knew the pomp and circumstance that associated playing in the granddaddy. Uh, we were heavy underdogs. Illinois came in undefeated. I think they were the first team to go 9-0 and in the Big Ten. Yeah, that's right. And beat every team in the conference. Yeah, they beat every team in the conference. So Jack Trudeau and company are coming out to, uh, to play us. Uh, and then we got word that they got invited to Hugh Hefner's Playboy Mansion. Oh. Hugh Hefner was an Illinois grad oh, and invited boy. his alma mater to, well, we live an hour, um, excuse me, a mile and a half from the Playboy Mansion. Right, right. Playboy Mansion's on Sunset, just off Charing Cross Road. Not that I ever saw a map or anything. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the point is, they're getting invited and we're not. And so that right. us. And, and we came running out of that tunnel feeling no pain, which was the other portion of the story, two things. I had food poisoning the night before the game. I've heard this. There were nine of us that ate some bad steak Oof. and woke up with terrible uh, food poisoning, which, you know, you're throwing up on the hour every hour. And it was, it was violent. It was no fun at all. Right. And I'm sitting there going, not on the day of the Rose Bowl, not on this day. Are you kidding me? Right. And I went to uh, our team doctor and I said, look, do you have anything for a stomach? He goes, and I'm whispering because there's no way I'm letting anybody know because I'm not, not playing. Right. Right. There, right. And, and uh, he said, you too, which now alerted me that I was one of several. Uh, and he offered me a pill to take that would settle my stomach. And listen, I have zero in the way of medical know-how, medical knowledge. I don't even take aspirin. Okay. <laughs> I just don't. He, I said, will it make me drowsy? I yeah. don't know where the question came from. I don't know why I asked, but I asked, right. he said, possibly seven of those nine kids slept in the locker room that day. Oh, wow. Never made it out on the field. They were wow. gone. They were out. What a great question that you had the instinct to ask there. I, Saved and, your day. And I was feeling terrible. I think it was Ohio State and Pitt were playing in the Fiesta Bowl, which was the game before ours. Right. And it was going long. So we were told it was going to be longer than normal back in the locker room segment. And I remember kind of feeling lousy about the pregame warmup. And I'm laying there feeling kind of punk. And I'm just having this choice conversation with the almighty saying, why today? Give me a break. Give me a chance. All this. And, and I come out of the locker room and we run onto the field and 
for everybody who watches it on January 1st, and in this case, January 2nd, you remember all the, the visions, right? The, the mountains in the backdrop. It's just, it's college football in a nutshell. Yes. But there's a rose is painted on the 50-yard line. Yes. This giant rose. And it's the grail. It's the holy grail of college football. And I remember running out there and not, I didn't notice it when we were in the pregame warmup. My, my, my back was to the 50 because you know, we go on opposite ends and stuff. And I'm seeing that. And it's, I'm, I'm promise you, Mark, it's like my feet never touched the ground. It was a yeah. magic, it was a magic carpet ride. And I never felt sick a moment. That adrenaline, I, I had no problems. Completed my first pass, said, let's go. And it, it was, I, I never felt sick again. I was, I, I was, it was, it was the instant uh, drug necessary to calm whatever ailed me. Yeah, I, I love that. I love hearing that about the Rose Bowl. The, it, it is college football in a nutshell. That was, that was well said. So that game for everybody, um, it, Rick's not getting into just how well he played. He threw for nearly 300 yards and four touchdowns and UCLA clobbered Illinois 45 to nine. It wasn't even close. Illinois was a top four team, 10 and one on the year with a real shot at the national title and UCLA just blew them out of the stadium. So you mentioned one thing you had the playboy mansion motivation. I get that. Boy, do I get that. (laughs) And, and, but two, what happened out there? Why were you guys able to just smoke them like that? Does anything stand out? I think Terry Donahue, and he would go on to win eight straight bowl games, eight straight. I think he had the perfect formula for making sure the bowl was a reward, but also that the ultimate reward was winning the bowl game. And so we had fun and it's hard to have fun when you're in your own hometown. Right. Cause yeah. we, we, we were basically, you know, right down the road from the Rose bowl. Uh, but the, the things that they set up for us and the fun that we had, we all felt like this was really cool reward for a season, uh, for the season that we ha- had and so forth. That was one. And then the attention to detail with respect to game planning, Homer Smith was our offensive coordinator and Homer just worked his tail off to give us the best possible plan. We knew some things about Illinois. I was given the keys to the car so I could make changes. There's a touchdown pass at the end of the first half where they've got a freshman corner out there uh, playing, and I can see Craig Swope, their safety, creeping down. And I knew here comes the strong safety blitz. So I had the chance to change the play, change the protection, keep Paul Bergman, my tight end in, and signal out to Michael Young, who'd played 10 years in the league, hey, you're going to run a post against that that little freshman corner, and we got them all blocked up, and it's a 53-yard touchdown. It, it, just brilliant coaching job, and uh, it was the right, right, uh, right plan for the right day, and it all worked out. Yeah, it sure did. Football 101 right there. That's a great story. Um, you mentioned this uh, a few minutes ago. You're – the college playing career is over, but you're immediately back as a coach at UCLA. You're coaching quarterbacks, you're coaching wide receivers. As you said, you started out with Troy Aikman. Now, for people, go on YouTube. You can watch that Rose Bowl game. You can watch uh, Coach Neuheisel play. He had a pretty sweet drop back in throwing motion, very smooth through a nice ball. Um, coach, did you just impart that to Troy Aikman? Are, in other words, are you to credit for what Troy Aikman went on to no. do? No, as a matter of fact, first time I ever saw Troy and we were out in the factors field and whipping it around, I called my mom and dad that night. I said, what the hell's the matter with the two of you? Why couldn't I look like him? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you talk about the perfect quarterback, uh, physical specimen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just absolutely had everything you're looking for, but what makes Troy Aikman so special and why he's still so successful today, even though his playing days are over, is he wanted to work on things that he wasn't good at. Ooh, nice. Most people want to continue to do the things that they're really talented in doing, and it, so it's impressive, right? It, it impresses everybody, and they get the accolades that come with that. Troy wanted to work on things that were his weaknesses. When I, when it got announced that I was going to be the full, I was the volunteer coach, literally what we would do on practice. 
I would grab all the injured players that could move around but couldn't be in contact. I'd get kickers, and we would go play football over on another field while the rest of the team's practicing, and we would basically play seven-on-seven seven, just all with him as the all-time quarterback. And I would make him play real coverages and run real UCLA pass concepts so that he would realize how these things work against the different coverages. But we kept standings. So every one of those kids that played over there was like, it was like playing in your backyard football. It was a blast. Practice would be over and our guys would have to come up for the team meeting. And then we'd want to go back over and finish the game. And it taught me two things. Number one, you can't make practice mundane. You got to make it fun. That was true. And, and how fun football is, the more you make it that way, the more you'll get what you're looking for in terms of the productivity. So uh, it kind of tweaked my coaching style when I got my own team. I love that philosophy of coaching and that idea about football and, and making it fun and, and keeping it competitive at the same time. I, I love that. It's going to lead into some of these questions I have as we move into your coaching career. Um, you said earlier, Terry Donahue was the guy who said meteoric rise was his term. He brought you back into court coaching. Um, your, your learning as you go, is Terry Donahue's structure, the way he builds a program, structures practice, organizes the day, is that influencing you as you go into your, your more serious coaching years at UCLA? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all, you know, kind of copy what we've learned and know to be successful. As I said, we were in an era where we were winning eight straight bowl games that, that run 82, 83, 84, 85, that was four straight wins in new year's day games, three Rose right. bowls and a fiesta bowl. So, right. uh, it, of course you're, you're going to pattern a lot of what you do after that. And I also thought Terry was brilliant in how he put together staffs, uh, there were a lot of talented coaches on Terry Donahue's staffs over the years. And so I tried to incorporate that as I tried to, when I went out and had to hire people to, to come and work for uh, uh, me at to the different locations, Colorado, uh, Washington and UCLA. Yeah. I'm, I'm always fascinated by that. It's, it's kind of, I, I didn't ask the best question in saying, did he influence you? Of course he did. You answered it much better than I asked it in terms of how he influenced yeah. you. I'm, I'm always fascinated by the, the, the way things are structured. What was it's, really fun. What yeah. was really fun, Mark, was when I got the job at UCLA, Terry and I took our relationship to another chapter, maybe the best chapter, if I look back on it, because now he is opening up about the challenges that he faced at UCLA from an administration standpoint. Yes. Uh, You know, from admissions, trying to get guys in school so that you can play against the same people that others are recruiting and so forth. Um, You know, we, there were no layers. There were no layers to the relationship anymore because player coach is, is a guarded one. You know, you, you like it to be open, but you don't tell them everything right. As a, a player everything um and coach assistant coach head coach is a different one but when i was now in a seat that he had occupied and occupied so beautifully then it was really a fun chapter of uh we were not in that hey coach you know now it was we were friends and i i enjoyed that uh more than he probably ever knew now. And, and we lost Terry a year ago uh, on July 4th, but I hope the last time I got to sit and talk with him was going to be lunch. The lunch turned into like three and a half hours. I think he knew then how important he was to me. And I know another, a bunch of my teammates all got those kind of opportunities as well. And they all felt really good about having had that opportunity. I love to hear that. It's kind of what college athletics are supposed to be. Eventually it's, it's supposed to be more than a transactional relationship. It's supposed to be something more than that. So I love hearing that about college football because it's not like that everywhere. And with all yeah. coaches, I, I'll well, have it, it, a football yeah, football's an instant gratification business. You, you, the scoreboard tells you if you're doing well, right? right. It just does. And we can't ignore that. If the scoreboard isn't telling you what you want to see, you're not going to last long in the business, right. whether it's a player or a coach, but, right. but the, but the beauty of football, and I think I speak for everybody who's been associated with it for any length of time, the beauty of football 
are the delayed gratification and those relationships forged over the course of time where you went through a journey that seemed insurmountable and you found a way to get there. That's the beauty of it. And, and coach and player don't often realize that until 20, 30 years down the road. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. When you were saying that I was thinking about uh, bear Bryant being buried with his uh, junction boys ring, There you go. which uh, that team went one and nine and bear won six national titles. So it gives you an idea about delayed yeah. gratification and appreciation. Yeah. It, the relationships forged are, are the glue and that's why no one leaves the game voluntarily. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of gratification, you didn't have to wait too long for gratification in terms of your coaching career. Age 33, I believe, you're made offensive coordinator at one of, at that time, college football's not only coolest programs, but great power center programs up in the Rocky Mountains, Colorado, Boulder. Within a year, you're taking over for Bill McCartney, who was just at that time, one of the titans of the sport, he built Colorado into something big, menacing, mean, stylish. It was a big brand. Um, when, when you get that job at Colorado, age 34, and you're looking out into the future, what are you thinking about yourself in Colorado and what's going to go on in Boulder? Well, first of all, I loved Coach Mack. Uh, we had a saying about him that he was not always right, but he was never uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> Mac Mac was uh, a one of a kind and he I think he saw me as a guy that he thought was going to have a chance down the road to maybe ascend to the level that he was at as a head coach. I don't think he realized he was going to walk away from the job one year into my time because he made me sign a 3-year contract. He said he wanted the same coach for Coy Detmer till Coy Detmer was done because he thought Detmer was special. And he was yeah. right about that. Coy Detmer was special. So I, I signed a three-year deal. Now, one year in, he's telling us he's leaving. The day he told us he was leaving, we were playing Iowa State to win uh, our, our 10th game and then get to a bowl game. He let us know in the morning, and I'm looking over his head. There was a phone right above his head because I needed to get on the phone because I had just bought my first house. Couldn't afford one in LA, but I had just bought my first house and my aunt, my wife's aunt was in town putting up what they call window treatments. Now you and I would call them curtains, but <laughs> window treatments somehow became a $7,500 expenditure. And I'm going, we might be out of here because he's leaving. And I know how this business is. There's no guarantee who's getting that job and no guarantee he's going to want me. Right. So I'm like, I'm on red alert because he's telling us we can't tell anybody. I said, well, you, I'm not going to tell anybody, but that window treatment guy, <laughs> he, <laughs> needs, he needs to stall that plan just for a, a, a day or so. But, uh, right. but, but that became nine days later, I'm the head coach Wow. nine days later. That's how fast this thing moves. Yep. I, I, I'm thinking I'm going to be the quarterback coach and passing game coordinator for the next three years. And nine days later, I'm the head coach of the Colorado Buffaloes. And uh, it kicked off what was has been a wild ride since. Yeah, that that is a crazy story. I'd never heard those details. Uh, it's great to get them, particularly the window treatments, because you can't take those with you, you know. You're, <laughs> no, not, you're not packing no, those up, I'm so you're just helping out going, the next guy. Yeah, 7500 bucks. We can save that. Let's, let's uh, call them <laughs> curtains again, honey. But uh, – we got the window treatments and it all turned out okay. It all worked out and it worked out well in the first couple of years at Colorado. Um, so first two years, you start 20 and four, you're back to back top 10 finishes, one top five finishes, win a cotton bowl, win a holiday ball. Colorado looks like it's still Colorado. Are you sensing, I, I found a quote from you later on where you said at Colorado, it was difficult, not impossible to get things moving. It was slow and arduous, even as things are ascending to the high heights at Colorado, you're, you're on the cusp of really playing for a national title. Is there an undercurrent you're sensing where it's going to be difficult to keep building maybe in the way Donahue sensed it at UCLA? Not all the universities are built the same. The, the infrastructures are different, uh, both from physical and a uh, workforce and, and ideology standpoint. And they're all wonderful, but the problem is your fan bases have expectations that aren't necessarily in line with the, with the 
belief of the university from an admission standpoint. We right. don't all get to recruit the same people. And so when you're playing teams that can rep- recruit players that you can't, then it becomes a little bit problematic to meet expectations. And what Bill McCartney had done in that final season, we'd won 11 games. We beat Notre Dame in the Fiesta Bowl and so forth. We were able to keep it going. We won 10 uh, in each of the next two seasons and finished, as you said, in the top 10. That's pretty darn good. Uh, and, and I thought we were going to be pretty good in 1997 as well. Uh, unfortunately, we got off to a bad start. A quarterback was kind of struggling. I didn't realize he was having some personal issues uh, that needed addressing. Uh, and that was, those are things that you learn as a young head coach. Uh, you know, how to, how, and, and so how we dealt with that adversity said a lot about our program. We ended up not going to a bowl game that year. I think we were five and six. And now what are you going to do in 19... 19- 98 because I'd been this, you know, hot young commodity, you know, taking his kids tubing down the Boulder Creek and all that kind of stuff. The avant garde new head coach. Now I got my nose bloodied, you know, not making it to a bowl game. What are you going to do the next year? And I was hot seat Henry, you know, everybody had to be on the, and we were going to play Colorado state in the opening game. And it was going to be the first time we played them down at uh, where the Broncos played at mile high at the time. I know it's gone through some name changes since, but right. uh, we're going to play them and everybody's got some any loop that's going to kick our tail. And I just remember focusing on that game and focusing on our team. And it was a great kind of recalibration for me as a young head coach that don't get up in the minutia of the noise outside, right? Get caught up in the details of the relationships in your program as well as the details of the fundamentals of your program. And we had a great night uh, taking care of the Rams. Yeah, a great night. And another, and it ended up being the last season in Colorado. It was a quality season. And then you move on to the University of Washington, still just 37 years old. I think at that time, the second youngest head coach in the country. Um, Washington, another prestige brand. I would say even a tier up from Colorado, especially if you're looking historically, Washington is definitely a tier up. Um, You get to Seattle, you're back in the Pac-10. You're going to get the Huskies rolling. We're still in a decade where they've won a national title. What's it like for, what's it like at Husky Stadium as a coach and players when the Huskies are rolling? What kind of ballpark is that to play in? It's awesome. Uh, it, it, It was a very special place remains a very special place because many of the folks in the Pacific Northwest have been born and raised there. It's not as transient as some of the other places I've been uh, yeah. in terms of people moving and coming and going. Right. Um, so there was a lot of dyed in the wool Husky fans. And you realize quickly when you get into a role as I took on there, how important it is to them. Uh, we got off to a good start in year one. We actually had a chance to play for a Rose bowl because we knock off Stanford, who was the first place team uh, in front of a packed Husky crowd. And when the Husky fan base is full and, and they're at Husky stadium, there's no home field advantage like it. Yeah. In year two, we knock off Miami with all yeah. those unbelievable players. I wanted to pull a curtain across the midfield deal. So no one had to look over there, see how many good, good players they had. Right. But, uh, we found a way to knock them off, uh, and we had a lot of great wins at Husky Stadium. I, I look back on those days very fondly. Obviously, it didn't end well, but uh, it was wonderful experience, and I've still got a number of friends in Seattle that I look forward to seeing. But I'm going to tell you, I would have stayed at Colorado. I, okay. had, I had the number one recruiting class, maybe if not one, then two, all set. I love Colorado. I love what we were doing. As things change in relationships, we talked about that. Yep. The guy who hired me, Bill Marolt, had left. He'd gone off to be the U.S. ski team president. The chancellor who hired me, Judith Albino, had left. And the president that had hired me had left. Or the chancellor, Rod Park, and the president, Judith Albino. All the people who hired me to create this team were gone. Right. So new personalities, no bad people, but new personalities they don't fit the same. And as soon as we had that little hiccup in 97, everybody was like jumping ship. I'm like, this is not as stable 
as it once was. I mm. turned down the UCLA job after year one. Oh, wow. They came after me when Terry retired in 95. And I said, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. These guys gave me this chance. I'm going to stay. And all of a sudden, everybody left. So you just get, you, it's important. That's why you look at Oklahoma with Bob Stoops. There he was, Joe Castiglione. I think David Bourne was the president for 17 years in a row. Yes. Those three guys. So if you get a leadership tryst, you know, this bond of people who see the world the same way. Yes. That's where you want to be. But I, I went to Dick Tharp, the AD at Colorado, and told him about this very uh, attractive offer from Washington. And I said, look, and he goes, how long do I have? And I thought he was asking to kind of create a counter offer and try to keep the thing going. Right. I said, as long as you need. And he goes, no, before you announce it. Oh. And I said, okay, that, 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 that's kind of an indicator. He, he's kind of looking forward to this too, which is all well and fine. But, right. But that's what people don't understand when they think there's, hey, you're being unfaithful, your team or something like that. It, it gets complicated. It, as I've said many times, Mark, football isn't complicated. It's intricate and it's, it's wildly strategic. People are complicated. Yes. And that's why we have all these stories that we get to follow in the world of football, whether it be at any level. Yeah, that, that's brilliant insight. I'm going to have a question about that when we circle back to UCLA in the CE, the common era. It's a fantastic point about the administration. I, I talk to people about that all the time when they're wondering in certain places why certain things are happening or not working. You need everybody to have a plan. It needs to be the same plan and they need to all be yeah. pushing. They need the shoulder on the same wheel, pushing the same direction to really yeah. get the big results, which is really what the top college football coaches do. Your Nick Sabans of the world, your Dabos, is they bring everybody together and say, this is the wheel. We're pushing this direction. Everybody, let's go do what you can. That's when it really breaks big, when it really works out as long as the other um, intangibles are there. You look at uh, Dan Radakovich, who was the Clemson AD during Dabo's run. He was the wind beneath his wings. You look at uh, uh, Chris Del Cani, who's now the athletic director at Texas. He, when he was at TCU, it was Del Cani and Gary Patterson that got yeah. TCU onto a level that people didn't believe possible 15 years prior. Uh, that's what, builds these things. Joe Castiglione in Oklahoma. That's a, that's a wonderful guy in charge of a wonderful program. And the people who work there are very fortunate to have had that kind of deal. That's not to say all the other folks aren't doing it, but if you're not willing to finance your expectations, then you're, you're in a collision course with doom. Yes. You're in a collision course with doom and it, it the easiest fix in the history of, of sport is to change the head coach. Right. Because everybody thinks you're just changing the fortunes of the program, not right. realizing what really is the problem lies way underneath that. Right. It's the old iceberg analogy. The head coach is uh, on top of the iceberg trying to plant the flag where well, the thing beneath is actually what what's, has the integrity, what's moving. So yeah. you're right. It's easy to pick the guy off the top of the iceberg, but guess what? You didn't change anything. Or you made changes around the edges. Um, so last last little bit at Washington. This also reaches a high high. Two thousand. Washington finishes eleven and one. They're an upset loss to bitter rival Oregon away from a national title. Uh, crush Purdue in the Rose Bowl. So um, for for you, coach, what's better, winning a Rose Bowl as a coach with the program you built, or winning as a player? What are the differences? I, this is a great question. I, it's as a coach. Because as the player, it was a blast and a euphoric high to, to walk off the field with my teammates. We won the Rose Bowl. I got to do it twice, right? One time as the starting quarterback. Yep. But as a play, as a coach, I knew what all these kids were in for. It's like, is it better to get open up your Christmas package as a kid, or is it better to watch your kids open Christmas packages, remembering the thrill you got and now getting to see it on your children's faces? That's what the deal is. I got to, and I got to set the itinerary. I got to set, hey, we're doing this. We're going 
Okay, Disneyland's on the deal. Fantastic. How about Magic Mountain? Let's get him out to Magic Mountain. We did that. Let's get him to the beach. Let's get him to the beach and have a couple days on a hotel at the beach before we move into the Rose Bowl Hotel. Let's go to a Laker game. Remember Christmas Day Laker games? Oh, yeah. Let's, let's do – and I set that itinerary, and my guys had a blast. And then I said, all right, in return to that, just like the Terry Donahue formula, now we're going to scale it back, and we're going to focus, and we're going to get ourselves the best possible effort so that when the granddaddy's over, it's our granddaddy. That, that's, that's the deal. Everybody understand? We're in. And they, because I had delivered, they delivered. And ultimately, it was a great experience. I love that. That is a great way to look at that. I, I, love, I, just, I love that concept of the fun and the football, never forgetting that everything you did is not going to mean as much if you don't win the big game. So even with all the fun, remember, we want to do this. We want to do this for all the work we've put in for our teammates, et cetera. It's, it's a great way to think about it. I would, I would have played for you, coach. Hey, you sound like a great, <laughs> well, great I, listen, it's it. to each his own, right? Jimmy Harbaugh takes his team out to play the orange bowl when he gets the Michigan job and they're playing Jimbo Fisher's Florida state team. And all of a sudden they won't go jet skiing. Florida State's the only team that will take advantage of the jet skis. Right. Think about that. Yeah. I mean, do you really have that many mature guys on the Michigan team that are saying, well, we don't want to have fun. We're right. here only to play a game. Right. You can do both if you, yeah. if you put it together. And by the way, go look at the score. Florida State won that game. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great point. It's a great point. Um, so we're in the we're, we're talking about Washington, the Pac-10, the Pac-12. Let's just talk about that league for a minute. Um, I talked to a lot of people about the Pac-10, Pac-12, Pac-8, Pac-5, AAWU, PCC. I wrote a big piece about the breakup of the PCC and the formation of the AAWU, which became the league we know today. It's a fascinating league. It's a strange league. There's a weird dynamic between urban and rural schools. Um, one thing I tell people is the Pac-12, particularly of recent vintage, wants to be an Ivy League conference and a major football power at the same time, but they don't want to swim in the water that major football schools swim in. You talk about the commissioner, Larry Scott, coming over from tennis, leading with Olympic sports, et cetera. Be in careful your, of what you wish for, right? Careful <laughs> yeah. what you wish for. <laughs> exactly. In, in your eyes, uh, coach, when you're looking at the Pac-12, where have they gone wrong of late it's gone more wrong than i ever imagined it could to be to be frank with you i i think you've hit the nail on the head they were trying to serve two masters they had this ideology of being an ivy league type of brand they're, they're almost every school in the league is part of the american association of universities they hold that in high esteem it, they'd be looking down their nose at, you know, taking on a school that had a state to it, right? Only the UCs could be part of the thing. Fresno State, San Diego State need not apply. Right. They don't belong, right? Uh, so there was a certain uh, bourgeois feeling about their, where we sat in this whole thing. But what they were holding on to was the Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl was their, was their, uh, their, treasure chest, right? They yes. knew that the Rose Bowl was their way of, you know, keeping themselves as one of the most viable conferences in all of college football. When we went to the college football playoff, the Rose Bowl, while still maintaining its spot as it should on January 1, lost a little bit of luster. Plus the other thing that we did, and th these decisions were just ill-fated. And I, I argued I, I get the job to come back to UCLA when it's still the Pac-10. And I'm sitting in a meeting and we're talking about nine conference games. We're the only Power Five conference to be playing nine conference games. I go, do you realize, and this is why we're still the Pac-10, we're guaranteeing ourselves five extra losses. Now we go to the Pac-12 and the college football playoff has started. I said, now we're guaranteeing ourselves six losses when four teams are going to get in. Four teams, and we know at least one Power Five conference champion isn't going to get in. It might be multiple because the SEC refused to let it only be conference champs that got in, and they should have. Mike Slide was wise to do so. But we were sitting there beating our, knocking ourselves off. It has, it, it defied logic. And unfortunately, while it, from a fiscal standpoint, it might have made sense because you don't have to buy another game. 
from a uh, playing ourselves, you know, the mantra, hey, let's keep it in house makes sense. It wasn't understanding what it means to recruit. And we have seen an exodus of people from the Pac-12 footprint leave oh. for schools that are playoff bound over and over again. Najee Harris from Antioch, California. Uh, DJ Uyungale, Los Angeles. CJ Stroud, uh, Rancho Cucamonga. Bryce Young from Pasadena. I mean, they're all playing for these big prizes. They're, and yet they're playing in campuses so far away, we can't go to watch them. And it's because we did this to ourselves. Yes, did it to themselves. That is that is exactly what happened. Those names you bring up, you look at them, the list is so much longer than that. It's all Americans, it's Heisman Trophy winners, it's national champions. And the, you know, the thing about college sports, if you look at recruiting maps and recruiting hot zones, and then you look at what universities and leagues are good, many college kids want to stay close to home. The more quality players you have near your university, the better your college football programs are going to be. That's just how it is with college. It's an age in life. It's a financial issue. It's many things. They want to stay home. So the idea that people are leaving the far west and like the Pacific Islands far west right. to travel to the southeast of the United States and play college football. That has to be a red alert for your league that you are not getting in front of the right people. You're not playing enough big games. You're not on TV enough and you're in big trouble. And it, the PAC 12 was almost NCAA esque in terms of how long they ignored these problems. Too long. And now they're in real precarious situation with the announcement that UCLA and USC are headed to the big 10. I mean, that as you went through the history of that league, that's almost heresy. Uh, I know there was some threats of it in the late seventies when the Arizona schools joined the pack eight to become the pack 10. Right. But, but it's a, it's a, it's a tale of, of believing that nothing bad could ever happen to us and yet making or, or whether it was action or inaction, the decisions end up being poor as to how to go about, you know, making sure the future was bright. Uh, two teams in eight years of the college football playoff, we've had two teams get a chance to play. Right. Washington got beat by Alabama in the Peach Bowl. Oregon beat Florida State in the uh, Rose Bowl to get to the national championship game and got beat by uh, Ohio State in year one. Those were years one and three. Right. Five years have come and gone without a Pac-12 representative in the college football playoff. And when you're not on TV in those situations, you're forgotten. And unfortunately, we're getting close to being forgotten, period. Forgotten quickly, too. The, as you get, you spend more time around sports and the culture of athletics, particularly, it's true everywhere. But in athletics, the recency bias is extreme. I mean, you disappear for one or two or three seasons and you are gone off a lot of people's maps you get people who join the sport at certain times I mean I, I there are a lot of people today who have no idea UCLA used to be a national football power and if you try <laughs> to tell them that they almost don't believe it they're like how is that what what uh, well, century was that and what planet Mark, did that happen Mark on? if you look if you look at uh, Martin Jarman who's now the athletic director at UCLA if you look at his comments about why he went to the big 10. Yes. He says, I inherited a hundred million dollar debt. Yes. A hundred million dollar debt. I mean, you can say that Carl Durrell, Rick Neuheisel, uh, Jimmy Mora, uh, can't coach. That was the reason. Or you can say maybe they weren't fiscally sound in how they were going about building this program. And maybe the program wasn't on this fine kind of financial footing to finance their expectations. And, yeah. and that, that to me is what's going on. I mean, Chip Kelly at Oregon was 46 and seven Right. at UCLA. He doesn't have a winning record, right? That's an impossibility given what you just said about having been on the campus and how beautiful it is and a chance to recruit to a place like that. And in the proximity of countless recruits that are, you know, within a hundred miles of school, R right? What, so what, what's not working here? It's a dedication and a commitment to finance those expectations. Yes, yes. Uh, someone put out a heat map, a recruiting heat map, just a few weeks ago. And, of course, the whole Southeast was covered with four or five-star prospects. Still a bunch in the old uh, industrial Midwest, the Rust Belt, they now call it, sadly. Uh, 
the biggest single heat map on that map was Southern California and California. I mean, the biggest red spot by itself was covering USC, UCLA, and stretching up towards another one in the Bay Area. And you think about all the schools coming in to raid like that, it's... um, it's amazing. So you you mentioned USC and UCLA and the threat to leave in 78. Absolutely true. They stood shoulder to shoulder and said, let these schools in or we're out. That had actually happened another time in the breakup of the PCC in the late 50s. Big scandals. It's a it's a great story. I got a piece on it. Um, I don't know, a great story, a, a compelling story. But USC and UCLA both threatened to go independent. The PCC dissolved. It was over. And USC and UCLA said, if we don't fix what's going on here, which was essentially small schools dictating to large schools. They said, we'll play an independent schedule like Notre Dame. We'll go national. We can do it. We're UCLA is just off a national title. USC is USC. So it it could have happened. The AAWU reformed around it. So this time with them leaving, it's actually a third time as a charm USC and UCLA leave. So as a football move in an athletic department move, you talked about the revenue that they must have. It's crazy, but how do you see it as a football move for these guys, the L.A. powers? I think they'll both be fine. Uh, I mean, if they have the resources to dedicate to the sport, recruit the same way the other programs in the Big Ten finance their recruiting machinery, they'll be fine. Because as you point out, that red heat map, there's plenty of players. And uh, I think all will be well. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a shot in the arm for the Bruins in particular because of their financial situation. But I, I just sit and think about how many great programs have been in the history of college football from the Pac-10, 12, and I'm just saddened by the fact that we are probably going to head into an environment where it's an also-ran. Yep. I mean, it's kind of been an also-ran, but we, at least we always had hope that we could turn it around. The, the college football playoff expansion to me was a hope that we could get, you know, regular representation. And because of it, maybe the West coast recruits would stay close realizing there is access to the college right. football playoff on the West coast, but that's not looking like it's the case. Listen, I don't know George Klyovkov. I've met him. I'm sure he's brilliant. And, and uh, I'm sure uh, he's got some aces up his sleeve. But to me, when he got that job, there was one job to do, one, and that is to secure. Everybody knew he got the job because of his media expertise, which means that he was right. going to put together a great media action when this one expired. Now, they're on a 30-day window right now negotiating with ESPN and Fox, their television partners right now. Once right. that 30 days expires, then they can go to the market and see what they can get, and we wish him well. But he had one job. To do and that was to secure USC, leaving my alma mater out of it. USC, that brand football wise, was a frustrated brand. That's why they went and paid the king's ransom to Lincoln Riley. Right. You had to ensure that they were going to stick with the Pac-12, whatever it took, whatever it took. You had to make sure. And for George Klyovkov to be in Montana, and obviously guys deserve vacations when he gets the news that this is happening is almost unthinkable to me. Yeah, not a good look. Very tough spot. I've been on radio the last couple of weeks talking to different people, Pac-12 today, Big Ten today. Uh, And and the the metaphor I've used, and I don't want to just totally absolve Klyavkov of responsibility. I, too, think he appears to be a brilliant guy. I think he had a chance. But what I said is he was he was given a torpedoed ship it was apparently too late to save the PAC 12 in its current state, barring a miracle. And I guess they couldn't stop the flooding. They couldn't fix the bulkheads and the ship was just on its way down. UCLA, uh, USC felt they had to go. Let me ask you this question in in, in kind of a little bit of a pushback on that statement. What about a contract? What about something signed when he creates the Alliance with the big 10 and the ACC? Oh, sure. I sure. mean, he stood defiantly in front of a camera and said, there is no need for signatures. We're gentlemen. Yeah. As if we were insulting them. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm, I'm going, uh, absolutely. Look, in concept, it was great. The idea to have this alliance with the three of them and get scheduling and create a three 
conference television package right. that includes the Big Ten and all those television sets. That conceptually was brilliant, but get it in writing. Yes. Because the same guy you just shook hands with, and, and I'm not disparaging Kevin Warren, I'm just saying he did what his job called for him to do, which is do what's best for the Big Ten. But he just lost the L.A. market, yeah. which means now he's going to have to see if he can keep Stanford, Cal, Oregon, and Washington from going to the Big Ten. They're all yeah. members of the Association of American Universities. He's going to have to fight, scratch, and claw to keep Utah, Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State from going to the Big 12. Right. I mean, he's going to have a lot of dinners with the Oregon State AD and the Washington State AD if he doesn't figure this out. <laughs> I, yeah. And, and I know he got dealt a bad hand, but you took the job. You needed to figure out how to draw an ace or two. Yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, I would push back a little on your pushback, getting a shoving match here. <laughs> You'll match my pushback. I'll match your pushback, sir. Now, I don't know if I'll match it or not, but what I would say is this is maybe the reason they didn't get a signature is because no one was willing to sign. Well, what? then it's not an alliance. Uh, okay, fair. Then very don't go out fair. there and call it an alliance. Very fair. You, you point. look foolish. Very. I mean, fair we all point. we all in the media asked, "What is this alliance?" Yes, we did. <laughs> the first yeah. game, the first game that was announced after the alliance, after they told us scheduling and so forth, was LSU and USC in Las Vegas. Yeah, LSU from the SEC. Not what an alliance member. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was it was a mess. I have I have heard through people I trust that the Big Ten had been vetting teams since the moment the SEC took Oklahoma and Texas and looking to expand. So of course they you're, were. You're right. There, the alliance it was almost like a placeholder, and then the alliance apparently. And if you're had, and if you're if you're George Klyovkov or whomever the Pac-12 commissioner is, right. which program can you least afford to lose? Starts with SC. Done. That. He should have take, built, bought a house downtown L.A. or a <laughs> condo up in the Ritz Carlton there and yeah. just been over in Mike Bones office daily. Let's yeah. put together a package for you. Let's get this done because you are our flagship program. Football yeah. wise, you're the one who moves this deal. Washington, Oregon, UCLA, they can all have their great pat on the backs and give themselves attaboys. But the one who moves the needle are the Trojans. Yeah. And you have to have them. It's a great, he should have set up office in Heritage Hall, uh, paid for a Starbucks to be moved in. Look, I'm a UCLA guy. Right. And I love the Pac-12 and I coached at Washington. I loved it. I loved it. Right. And, and, and I coached at Colorado and I loved it. And I love all those schools and will defend them to the day I die. Right. But SC, who I absolutely, I went to law school there and I, I appreciate SC as much as anybody, but playing them. I wanted to whip their tail more than anybody else because right. they were that good. Right. But they move the needle. They're yes. the, they're the chit. You cannot let them leave. And that had to be secured. You might say George, uh, Kevin Warren doesn't have to sign a paper, but you needed Mike bone to sign a paper, or you needed to find a way to put some exert some pressure to get it done. You can't. And, and, and I'm, this is unfair to George clay because everybody deserves a vacation, but just take it for what it's worth. You can't be in Montana when they're leaving for the Big Ten. All this is extremely fair, and there's a ton of merit to it. When you're talking about uh, USC and giving the, the, the plaudits and the credit, I'm reminded of John Adams and facts are stubborn things. It doesn't matter what you think about USC, if you're their biggest rival or not. There's certain facts about USC football. They move the needle. They move the needle. It's, it's undeniable. So... We've got into many of this stuff. All, all of this is moving towards an expanded playoff. The way I always say it to people is 84 TV began to buy up the regular season beginning in 1990 when the bowl Alliance and the bowl coalition came together. And then the BCS, the BCS was television's crowbar into the postseason. This is all they've since the 1960s, if not earlier, television has wanted a rationalized postseason in college football. They're on the cusp of getting something like it or college football's version of rationality, which often is highly irrational, as you know. But we're moving towards an expanded playoff here. Right. Do you what do you see happen there? What do you think ought to happen for college football in its expanded postseason? It's the revolutions here. It's coming quickly. 
Without question, and I'm for it because I think it will bring recruiting back to a norm. Uh, although the super conference move is maybe changing that idea as well. But, but I will say this. NFL makes $10 billion a year annually. Oh, I, that's redundant. $10 billion a year for their, for their television rights. $10 billion. College football currently, until this new Big Ten deals announced, is about a billion, maybe a billion plus. 10% college Saturday inventory as opposed to Sunday inventory. And we know on Saturdays there's way more inventory, right? Right. We are so wildly undervalued Yes. in a world where reality TV is absolute and real-time TV is absolutely the gold bullion because it forces viewers to watch in real time, right? You yes. can't Tebow it and watch it late at night because someone will have told you the score. You want the drama, reality TV. You want to see who wins. You want to see who loses. It's like The Bachelor, but you can't consume it after the fact. you got to know right, right now. Right. And throw in sports wagering. People love being involved. This is the coup de grace of, of entertainment for those television people. And they're tired of paying billions for the NFL. They have to because they know those the eyeballs are there and they right. get to promote their week's slate of shows and all that stuff. But they can get they can get the same thing on Saturdays, pennies on the dollar. And that's what they're doing. They're buying it up in chunks. And yes. because the NCAA has nobody responsible for the NCAA, they're, Mark Emmert's lame duck. He's on his way out. They gave up after the Alston case shut him out nine to zero, saying there was amateurism. Everybody else, all these, as you pointed out, 1984 Supreme Court decision everybody's got their television rights. They all gave them to their conferences. So the conferences are acting independently. What we have here is laissez-faire people survival of the fittest. Yes. And, and, and we, instead of everybody throwing their rights in, like they did for Pete Rosell back in the sixties in the NFL, LA and New York saying, wait a minute, we're going to give our big markets and we're going to be the same as green Bay and Buffalo. And he says, trust me, it will work. And it did. Yes. We didn't have anybody being Pete Rosell for college football. We didn't have it. And because of it, now we're this, this, the train has left the station. With that being said, college football is going to be wonderful, still going to be consumed. And the question is how many scholarships and opportunities are we going to lose for young people? Because Mark, if we ask anybody involved in college, college athletics, anybody, coaches, players, administrators, commissioners, NCAA people, they would all in, in 50 words or less in a mission statement about college athletics, talk about the experience of the student athlete. We're trying to, we have lost our compass. It's all, it's a business. Now you can sit there and Hey, the business is good for the student athlete, but we're diminishing the opportunities because not every team's going to be able to make this super conference slate. They don't quote out value ads. Right. That's what, that's the language we're using right now, rather than the value of the student athlete experience. Right. And therein lies the crime. Therein lies the crime that we allowed this era of time to go without somebody standing there and saying, what, what's best for all. Right. So coach that, when do we make you commissioner of the game and how do we do that? Is that possible? <laughs> Can we make that office happen? Cause well, the, the sport needs a czar or something. Let, uh, my first choice is Greg Sankey. He has been brilliant in his stewardship yes. of the sec. And yes. he, every time he speaks, it's measured, it's calculated, and it's sincere. Yes. And, and I, I love listening to him, and I think he would be fabulous taking the role of everybody. But that's not his job. Yeah. His job is to look after the SEC, and he's been brilliant in doing, doing it. Yep. Uh, the next guy I would say would be Barry Alvarez. Great choice. And, and, and in that same slot, 2A and 2B, Gene Smith. Gene Smith, the, I, I think those two guys, Barry Alvarez and Gene Smith, and this is not to take away from Kevin Warren, but he's not been in college athletics nearly as long as either one of those two guys. Right. I think right. he's, I think he's incredibly wise to be listening to those two guys because yes. I think they are helping lead this, this, uh, big 10, uh, excursion package, uh, to great heights. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Yeah. It's when you're talking about Greg Sankey and how it's not his job to look over all of college football, it's, it's a point that I make to people all the time is, 
College football is not one sport, and these conferences are classic frenemies. They are friends until it comes time to stab each other in the yeah. back for something better. That's a problem. So maybe I talk big revolution, small revolution in terms of what's happening right now. Maybe one of the outcomes of this is college football comes together as a full sport. They almost did it with the BCS, not quite. They got a little closer with the CFP. Maybe they finally rationalize this and say we should be working together instead of trying to kill each other off. In 2011, I think the fellow's name was Michael Martin, uh, was the chancellor at LSU. I may be wrong on the name. Forgive me if I am. But I think that's right. He said, we're not far away from having a ESPN conference and a Fox conference. Yes. Well, welcome to the future, Mr. Martin, because that's where we are. Now, I work for CBS. I got I got my fingers crossed that we get a good chunk of this, right? And right. I, we'll wait and see what is announced here in the coming weeks as Big Ten's getting ready to unveil their new television package. But, But the bottom line is, we should be operating as an entity selling, taking this to market rather than separate entities. Because yes. if we use the NFL model, that's how the Cincinnati Bengals can get to a Super Bowl. That's right. They, they can't get to a Super Bowl if we do what we're doing. And, and we scream about the lack of parity in college football. I think we like the big brands, but, but we would love for more parity. We would love for more chances and bites at the apple because as much as we love alabama ohio state georgia name the iconic brands right we also love app state beating michigan we we love uh that upset that coastal carolina team that no one had heard of all of a sudden playing on teal what are we what's happening right we we, we can't get enough of those storylines right right that little train that could, that all of a sudden finds its way to a position of prominence. UCF, the story of UCF is a great one. Yes, right? it is. Uh, and, and having their own Main Street Disneyland parade of a 13-0 and 0 season. All right. right? That was so great. If we're not careful, we're going to lose some of these programs or, or the oh, future yeah. programs that would have provided those stories because we just didn't come together and put this all on the plate because I promise you, Television needs college football because yes. it brings the advertisers because you have to watch it in real time. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting. Both things are true at once. Yes, television has a major controlling lever on college football, but also television needs college football. It's not all one way. So, well, it's true. People say, oh, television is calling all the shots. Yeah, they are in certain ways, but the schools have to go along with it. And they can they have a lot of leverage of their own to push back on TV. That's yeah. why you need smart people leading them in the right directions and not, you know, people talking about bogus idealism that doesn't actually exist when it's hard dollars on the table. If you're Oklahoma and Texas, you're fired up. If you're UCLA and USC, you're fired up. If you're Washington State and Oregon State, you're going, what the oh, hell no. happened? Right. <laughs> what the hell happened? Right. Yeah. It, it, they do. College football does not want to lose the Oregon States and the Wazoos no. of the world. It's a far less interesting sport without without those. There's nothing schools. like Martin Stadium or Research Stadium on a Saturday. That's, that's, that's right. Um, let's close with this, Coach. Um, NIL. Uh, name, image, likeness, open market, athletes finally being allowed to profit. That's a great thing. There's so many great things about athletes being able to cash in on the amount of work they put into their sports. We, we passed the point of absurdity of athletes not being able to cash in on themselves long, long ago. But that leads to my question. This didn't have to happen like this. Right. How badly did the NCAA handle this transition to what I'm just calling the 21st century? Well, listen, it's hard to sit there and say disparaging things uh, when people aren't in the room. You feel like you're talking behind people's backs. But, but the NCA had to see this coming. To spend $70 million to keep fighting for their concept of amateurism as, as this pie kept growing and growing and growing, it's like people asking people not to notice the elephant in the room. Right. I mean, the, the, the elephant in the room was the elephant. Not just Alabama, but 
the elephant of cash that was coming in, whether it be the basketball tournament or whether it be the, the enormous money for television rights, coaches' right. salaries. It's incredible. And to say that the players were not going to get their piece of that pie was ridiculous. And the Supreme Court said so, nine to zero in the Alston case. Yep. So now all that work on the working committee, which, by the way, Gene Smith was a part of, all that work on the working committee to how to incorporate name, image, and likeness within the framework of the current rules went by way of the whales. They just threw it out. So we have a wild, wild west right now. Yes. The only way to get this genie back in the bottle, in my mind, mindful of all the time of courts, and, and, and they, they talk about you know legislation to make it unanimous in terms of the country and what the rules are. I think that's a piece. You're not going to get that done until after 2022 in the midterm elections. Those people in Congress have other things to think about right now. But if you can get some sort of rule over the course of it and then collectively bargain, not necessarily a union, Mark, but, but get somebody who's certainly uh, got the qualifications, uh, has argued on behalf of a labor force before yeah. to sit on behalf of the student athletes. As you look at the pie available in college athletics, all the economics are there for everybody to consume and, and digest. You sit there and you let them say, okay, players, we're going to supersize your scholarships. Cause remember this money isn't just financing football. It's financing all the entire athletic department, right? So supersize scholarships on campus make you know, whether it be health benefits, whether it be a little bit more spending money, whether it be travel expenses for families to come to games, you're supersizing the contracts, but they're going to get a percentage of the pie. Then you can sit there and say name, image, and likeness can't kick in until after your freshman year. Okay. Just like you have a salary cap for rookies in the NFL, you right. can collectively bargain for that. And it passes muster with the courts. You can do that. You can say the transfer portal is open during these windows and closed otherwise. So coaches have a chance to have some roster management because the transfer portal works both ways. Coaches wanting to move players on coaches wanting to bring players in at right. the end of the day. And then the other piece of this is you have to negotiate that when a kid goes in that transfer portal, his scholarship is paid for while he's in there. Cause right now we have guys in the abyss. We have youngsters that are in that portal thinking that well, I'm going for greener pastures and there's not a pasture for him to go to. And that means his college education's on stall plan. That yeah. can't happen. We got it. Whoever he left is paying for him until he's gone so that we have some sort of uh, uh, way to finish the job, right? That the, the, the NCA commercial says for people who are going pro in something other than sport, right? right? That's, that's the, 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 commercial we all watch and say what a wonderful thing we're in that's in the mission statement about i talked about just a little while ago we need to make sure and if we have somebody sitting there the supreme court will say this all makes sense and we can get this genie back in the bottle and, and kids can have the ultimate college experience my my catchphrase when i was in a room as a head coach sitting down with a mom and dad trying to get their son to come and be a part of my program the last thing i would tell them is look you have a wonderful family. I want your son to have the best experience, the same experience that I had and why I am in this business, because I want for your son to have that experience in his collegiate time. And then for his son to have that same, that's what we're, that's the kind of model we're building. Yeah. And that's what every school in the country should be doing. We're not, we're not professional sports. I don't like us moving that way. We're about college and student experiences. Yeah, we want to play competitive games and we will, but we cannot push kids out and not and forget about their education. I, I, I love that. I love the emphasis on the collegiate nature of the experience. Yeah. A, a lot of things are going in a professional direction. But it doesn't mean you have to go all the way. You can feature this into certain sectors where it's more pro-like. But remembering always it's a college game, the college is, is being forgot far too often in these discussions. The way certain things are talked about, it's like, so is this football team even attached to the university anymore? Or are they just wearing the colors or what? Which is are why these... I go back. We cannot lose the educational model because here's yeah. the facts. Yeah. 2% of these kids are going to get to go play in the NFL, right? 2% of them. And half of those are going to play less than three years. Yes. Which yes. means they better be ready for life after football. Right. And if we don't, if we, do, if we keep 
Do you realize 54 kids that were on USC's team last year are no longer on it? It's wild. 54. It's Where wild. are they? How many of them are going to another school, are getting their education paid for? That's, we, that's what we have, the adults in the room have to be doing. And if we don't, shame on us. Yeah, well said. One of the things you were talking about is very interesting because it's something I've been trying to piece together as I think this through. When you talk about, you said not necessarily a player's union, and I think that's smart because there's too much turnover in college but athletics. As soon to as you make union employees, members. you can fire them. Right. We, there's this, this many is, elements. Yeah. We want kids to come to school, love school, love their time. Now, I'm not naive to the fact that everybody thinks they're going to the NFL and wants to play with the big boys and wants to play at the highest level. Good for them. But what we have to do is make sure that the rules require an education, matriculation through the school. They hold schools responsible for those who leave the school whether financially for their educations, but, but absolutely do that. And while we can point out number of great transfers, when you, when you are at a school and you want to transfer and, and your school would like for you to keep, we can go back to that old transfer rule where you sit out a year. You don't lose any eligibility, but you sit out a year. So there's an incentive not to poach each other's players. Right. Because, because it's, it's bad for business. It's a bad look. The NFL has contracts. You are free agent. You go. And, right. and by the way, there are times when you, it's a good move. A new coach comes in. I'm going to run a different offense. You don't fit this offense. I'm going to sign your deal and you go. And now you don't have to sit. Right. You go immediately. This, this is a common sense business. And unfortunately, common sense is not very common right now. Yeah, uh, absolutely. When you see this person speaking on behalf of athletes, would that be like a permanent position the guy who bargains on behalf of the athletes and like athletes yeah, move I mean, in and I, out I, I mean we, we we see marvin miller was the old guy for major league baseball right uh yeah. I, i'm i'm picturing a union leader but i don't want a union because yeah. i don't want it i don't want it to be employees but someone with that kind of background that knows numbers yeah that so when the deal is presented because it eventually will get to the courts when the deal is presented it passes muster yeah. And so we, we have an antitrust exemption yes. so that you can make some deals which require name, image, and likeness to wait till you're a freshman. So you can't use it to recruit a guy. Yeah. That doesn't sit well with people. And right. it also forces universities now to go to the same people who you've been getting money from to build your buildings. Now you got to go and get them into these collectives and I you're going to wear fans out. Yeah, you're going to wear them out. Well, how much more money do you need? And by the way, aren't you bringing in a pot full? Why aren't you using that for this deal? I mean, we have proliferated beyond belief and it's time to just rein things in and just say, look, this is about the student athlete. Let's do right by the student athlete. Yeah, that sounds ideal. I hope that I hope something like a little that Pollyanna for you, a little, a little, uh, I don't want to call Lucy it in the sky with diamonds. <laughs> I don't want to call it that coach because I, I think it's what ought to happen. So I don't, I don't find it Pollyannish, but I do find it. It would be the tough road to hoe. And sometimes we're ready to do that. I mean, this country has been known over time when the, when the gauntlet has come down to step up to the challenge. So Maybe we still have enough people like that living here that this will be a moment when we rise to an occasion. I, I hope it is because in that model, I think college football is pretty healthy going forward. Whereas if kind of the opposite of that happens and the business side is all that's considered, I could see a toxic situation developing and not taking too long to develop. So that's kind of the, the way I'm looking at what you're saying. College football, I just was at an SEC media days and I got to interview a bunch of kids. I can guarantee everybody out there who loves college football that's worried about the future, the kids are the same. They're yeah. wonderful. They're, they're bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, can't wait to play. Did all the same hard work in the summer that we used to 100 years ago. Yeah, they got some flashy clothes because they can get a little money in their pockets, but who, who in the heck cares about that? I mean, they're going to be fine. They're going to be fine, by and large, the vast majority. What we have to do is just make sure we maintain as many of those opportunities as we can, rather than create such a, you know, a super league 
that we lose a bunch of kids who now otherwise won't have the means and ability to get a college education. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's well said. We're going to end it there on a hopeful note. Uh, coach, I could, I could go on talking to you about college <laughs> athletics and all this stuff all day, but I have taken a lot of your time. So I want to thank you, Coach Neuheisel, for coming on today. It was really my pleasure to have this conversation and, uh, you know, hope to connect with you down the road talking more college football. I'm sure we will, Mark. Uh, great passion. Uh, when you get to dot the I in Columbus or, you know, uh, see Ralphie run in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, 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 we've got a great game. Let's just take care of it. It's a beautiful thing. All right, Coach, take care of yourself uh, and, uh, you know, hit the ball well today. I'll do it. See you now. All right, sir. Take care.